It's been hard to avoid mention of Mars this past month, with the well-timed coinciding of NASA's announcement of strong supporting evidence for seasonal flows of liquid water on Mars today, with the build-up to the release of Ridley Scott's new film The Martian. I'll have more to say about The Martian in a subsequent video, but for the time being I just wanted to address a number of questions that I've received about what the implications of NASA's latest discovery could be for Mars 1. So what was this discovery? Well, it kind of boils down to the detection of strong evidence for hydrated salts on Mars in certain regions, particularly magnesium perchlorate, sodium perchlorate, and magnesium chlorate, in regions that contain transient dark streaks called recurring slope lineae, or RSL. The results were based on spectral analysis by the CRISM instrument aboard the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and provide convincing evidence supporting a prior hypothesis that RSL are formed due to seasonal flows of running water on Mars today. Indeed, whilst the astrobiological implications of this discovery are certainly profound, and if you want to hear me discuss them you can check out this recent interview I had with Russia Today about this just over there, for Mars 1 there's really little effect overall. The key reason being that RSL are found to be predominantly located around equatorial regions and in southern latitudes, whilst Mars 1 intends to land at between 40 and 45 degrees north. This requirement is primarily driven by satellite observations of the regions containing a prevalence of continuous water ice deposits within 30 centimetres of the surface, as you can see demarked in this figure by the regions north of the red line. It's worth noting though that you could land as far south as the northern part of Amazonis Planitia at 35 degrees north minus 150 degrees east, which does have the distinct advantage of greater potential solar energy. In actual fact, any organisation considering landing on Mars would be wise to avoid the regions containing these RSL, for the simple reason of trying to prevent contaminating them in these potentially viable environments with Earth microbes. Mars One is advised on such matters by Professor John Rummel of COSPAR's Panel of Planetary Protection. Their planetary protection policy defines a concept of a special region as being a specific area of Mars that requires at least Category 4C sterilisation for any mission landing in their vicinity, which is similar actually to the kind of sterilisation protocols that the Viking landers had to go through, which was extremely extensive. Indeed, RSL have been recently identified as one of the prime candidate regions to be classified as a special region. If you're interested though in learning more about COSPAR and actually how these special regions are decided upon and the latest up-to-date analysis, I'll post a link down below to a paper authored by Professor Rummel in the journal Astrobiology that goes into this in depth and also to the paper about these transient liquid water flows on Mars. The media attention surrounding NASA's discovery is part of what seems to be a growing trend of public excitement towards Mars exploration and human missions to the Red Planet, and Mars One has been no exception this past month, with a series of documentaries released exploring the project. Firstly, there was Citizen Mars, a five-part series of short films by AOL and Engadget that explores the lives of five of the Mars 100. The true strength of this series is in its ability to weave a narrative stretching from Italy, Egypt, South Africa, India and the United States that serves to explore the incredible diversity of people involved in this global project. Personally, I think the series really takes off from episode 3 onwards, and each episode stands on its own merit, so by all means feel free to pick and choose if you're short on time. And it's also worth mentioning that the series has been enhanced by a collection of bonus videos and Huffington Post articles created by the cast, links to which I'll post down below. Now, if you're predominantly interested in the technical aspects behind Mars One's mission, I suspect you'll be left feeling somewhat disappointed, since this series predominantly focuses on the personal lives and motivations of those involved. But not to worry, because here's something just for you. I can now reveal that Mars One has been working with Bigger Bang Productions to produce a series of documentaries called Destination Mars. This five-part series is distributed internationally and online by Curiosity Stream, an online digital streaming service for educational content founded by the creator of the Discovery Channel. Destination Mars examines many of the key technological hurdles required to enable Mars One's mission to succeed. For instance, it examines survival on Mars, the Mars Transit Vehicle, as well as entry, descent and landing, just to name a few. 
It includes Mars One team members, advisors, candidates, independent experts, with one particular highlight actually being a series of extended interviews with Mars One's Chief Technical Officer Arno Wielders. Now I'll admit, I am partially biased because I appear briefly in episode 5 of the series, but I am genuinely impressed by the high quality production value of this series, as well as the consistent effort made to speak to key critics of the project, examining their concerns about the mission's overall profile. And genuinely, at least in my mind, overall I think this is the best production about Mars One's mission that at least I've seen to date, so it's highly worth taking a look at. You can check out the trailer to Destination Mars just over here, but if you're ready to watch the series right now, it's available on Curiosity Stream, and I'll post a link just down below. I will note though that Curiosity Stream is a premium service with a recurring monthly charge after one free month, but if you're just interested in watching Destination Mars, then you can cancel immediately after watching and you will not be charged a penny. If you are interested in Curiosity Stream service in general though, when registering, if you enter the code MARS1, or one word, it'll give you a 20% discount for the first five months. But again, I reiterate, there is no upfront cost to watch Destination Mars. So really, no excuse. And finally, with regards to documentaries, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to a short one called Inspiration Mars. And no, not the mission with the same name. But this is a documentary that explores my own thoughts on the implications to wider society of Mars One succeeding. And it deserves a special mention by the somewhat bizarre fact that when I was being interviewed for this, I was actually inside a human hamster ball suspended by a chain, which I don't think very many people have had to experience. But that's definitely worth checking out, and again, link down below. Now on to candidate news. So in the run-up to the final rounds of the selection process taking place next year, in the Mars 100 we try and regularly organise candidate meetups in order to enable more informed team building and foundation once we gather for the group challenges at the simulation outpost next year. This month saw Hannah from the UK and Angel from Spain meet in Barcelona, Australian candidates Josh, Diane and Natalie meet in Melbourne, and myself and New Zealand candidate Saeed meet in Auckland. Now, New Zealand, wow, New Zealand was just an incredible country, and so diverse in the things that I got up to over there. It ranged from speaking to school children about human missions to Mars, visiting the set of the Shire, as well as jumping from a plane 15,000 feet over the real world Mount Doom. In any case, I'm back in the UK now, and as you can possibly tell from the change in scenery, I've now moved into Cambridge in order to start my PhD in astrophysics. As to what this means though for the frequency of videos in this channel, that remains to be seen, but at the very least I'll still be producing these monthly updates on Mars One. I do still have many videos in active development of course, in particular this long overdue review of the findings of New Horizon from the Pluto system, which will be freshly updated with all the latest discoveries that have been trickling in over the past few months, so don't worry that's still coming, I haven't forgotten about it. But I'm also particularly keen, once I've settled into my research, to begin a series on exoplanets that would go beyond, you, you know, the kind of usual qualitative popular science descriptions in order to examine the techniques and the mathematics behind exoplanet characterization and their detection. You know, let me know what you think about that actually, down in the comments, or if you have any suggestions, I'm of course always eager to hear what you have to say. Thanks for watching. If you're new to this channel, I produce Mars One mission updates around the end of each month, as well as content on human spaceflight and planetary science. This month's feature video is a recent TEDx talk by South African Mars One candidate and quantum biologist Adriana Marais, exploring how Mars One fits into the story of astrobiology. Next week I'll be reviewing The Martian, but in the meantime you can follow me on Twitter and subscribe to keep up to date with the latest developments in the Mars One mission.